Hi, and welcome. I'm Erin Schneider. I work with the North Central Sustainable Egg Research and Education Program. Welcome to Farming Matters. It is a program of the North Central Sustainable Egg Research and Education Program, and we're really here to highlight um, insights from their farmers and what they've learned from their uh, on-farm research, which really covers a wide spectrum um, under the umbrella of sustainable agriculture. Ponte Leon, Ponte for short, of Masse Wakwali Farm, which means I think the people's farm, and he will take you to his farm and his project in just a moment. I also wanted to introduce um, Marie Flanagan, who is the um, SARES communication specialist and the host of this program. And so Marie, thank you for orchestrating behind the scenes. And Panta, I'm going to, to be quiet here on this end and just let you just share share your story about how, you know, take, tell us about your farm and what kind of, um, how you arrived at your project and what other farmers um, could learn from you or with you um, in your in your project journey. Yeah, so my name is Panta Leon Flores. I use he, him pronouns. And uh, I have, a, I think it's technically like 0.8 acres uh, farm. The project wouldn't have happened had I not lived in California for a while. So, you know, there the libraries there had much more information about Mexica people or indigenous Mexican people than I ever had access to here in Kansas. I just started learning about the different codices that do exist. And the Florentine Codex is the one that I found the instructions in. So I found some instructions. I was already practicing no-till. I was already planning and planting corn. Uh, my SARE project was a comparative yield analysis. So I was utilizing the instructions that I was speaking about earlier from the Florentine Codex about how to, how to grow, cultivate corn. Um, and just like no-till practices, like I would have used had I not found the instructions. Um, and, and they were quite similar. So when I say comparative yield, there were a lot of things that were, were very similar. So row spacing, I kept the same. Uh, density in the row, I kept the same. Water given to it, kept the same. Nutrient input kept the same. Um, and the really only main things to it were mounding at three various stages um, of the corn's growth. So um, the mounding, it was, was what was really being tested in that, I think. And um, after doing that study, I did three different samples. The first one was pretty successful. And uh, it yielded, I think, between five and seven percent more in the ancestral instructions than in the uh, than in the uh, no-till instructions. So go check the report and double-check me on that, I guess. But uh, but yeah, the, the second sample flooded. It was it flooded just. It was an outlier. It was a flooded outlier. Um, it was like an island of corn, like, stand, like standing in a corner. Uh, and then the third sample uh, did really well as well. It was in, within that range too. So significantly more yield um, to the ancestral instructions with that corn. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you got, how you got your seed? So the seed that uh, I use for the project and for breeding projects um, on the farm generally is from the plant induction station. So the USDA has a bunch of different uh, seed banks around the country, active breeding stations and research stations. And uh, as a farmer, you can apply for uh, different accessions or seeds um, at, at the various seed banks. And so the Guanajuato that we were talking about, the Lote Conico, it was obtained originally from an application to them. So as a farmer, I can write, I'm doing this research. Um, I researched within your seed bank, this seed, this is why I want to pick that one. And you kind of go into more detail on that. Um, and you, they also um, include cultural research within the like um, application process. So uh, they can award that to people who are also quote unquote just doing cultural research as some as some might say but like um, I thought that was really important and uh, I, I made an application for corn for that project since then I've made an application and received the seeds for beans and squash to do the three sisters um, also crops from Guanajuato and uh, peanuts which are also from Guanajuato too. The, the SAIR project also provided a really valuable tool. It was uh, one of the pieces and things I wrote into the budget um, was uh, a double wheel hoe with a U-bar attachment. So you can hill corn when it's you know taller than three inches. Uh, <laughs> and 
and that helped uh, a lot with the project. And I still use that today. I still let um, the other farmers at the incubator farm use it. I can, if I wanted to get other attachments for it and swap them out and use it, use it as well. Uh, fortunately, we have uh, three other wheel hose with attachments on them that have been collected over time and our communal use on the farm. So I'd say one of the one of the top units on the farm is for sure the wheel hoe collection. Um, I can't say anything bad about the Jang cedar if I have a really well prepared bed. Um, it's nice that we have communally sourced one of those. Uh, but yeah, in the no-till world, everybody always talks about broad fork this, broad fork that, and I'm not mad about broad forks, but there's definitely other tools that I, I enjoy working with a lot more. I was already practicing no-till. I was already planning and planting corn. Um, I forget how I learned about the Sayer Grant, um, unfortunately, but heard about it and was like, okay, I could actually do cultural work professionally within being a farmer growing produce and doing that. Obviously, the most the bulk of my work. <laughs> um, and so I, I was like, why not? Let's sign up for it. And I was like, well, if I'm going to have access to this, I'm going to try to find access for two undergraduates, which they ended up being my researchers. And uh, it was a really good experience for everybody. It was really cool. And so I, I, I liked incorporating more people on the project. And I think that um, really elevated the final report too. So I'm sure we'll link to the to the final report and all that. But Ashley and Paula's uh, uh, ethnographies are one of the best parts of the report. Their writing is just so powerful. And so for thinking of, um, you know, sustainability within agriculture and, and having a component like an ethnography on research, um, you get to like engage with agriculture in a way that um, I think is socially responsible because we as farmers should find the joy in our work. You want to share a little bit about what you discovered or learned through outreach on your on your grant project or how are you able to connect what you're doing to your the broader community? Outreach for the grant research was really interesting because it manifested itself in so many different ways, right? And so it got to go to um, community meals, which was beautiful. so it got it got turned. The corn was uh, turned into hominy um, and and using a pozole. That was really, really beautiful and delicious. Um, uh, it was sold to restaurants as well. So it got eaten by many different people um, at, at restaurants too. And that's, we're talking about the economic factor and within Sarah Research and uh, trying to help farmers out. Uh, that's That helped me out for sure to have, uh, to have a crop to bring to market. Um, that was the blue corn though, because the... Uh, you're not supposed to sell what you grow from the from growing out the seeds from the uh, from the plant induction station at least in in like a first stage right because some of that's like um, you know seeds that are used for breeding purposes are not even necessarily seeds that would produce something that you could even eat so I could have had to work two years to get to corn for example um, like that was that was nice and yielded um, in a way that was responsible uh, for land use too so so the corn that I am breeding, here's a, a cob that I, I planted the rest of it, but here, hold that nice and steady if I can, here's uh, <laughs> some of that's left on that cob that didn't get planted out. So it it is a, uh, it's called Elote Conico, is the race um, uh, of the corn, and kind of the end of, end of the corn is one of the ways that you read kind of like what kind of corn it is too, it's kind of rounded, um, but they, here, this is a small cob that it produced as well. So it's white, uh, purple, and white and purple speckled, or purple and white speckled, almost kind of looking. <laughs> so it, it one of the ideas is to breed uh, a lavender colored masa, essentially. So that's kind of like thinking product, and that's that's kind of the goal of what I'd like to to produce with this with this corn. Um, and so I guess for the use of the corn, there's the community meals, there's restaurants. Um, I've been able to experiment with it. I, I count that as like something really important. And then um, it's cultural stewardship again. So going back to that, I mean, this corn is from uh, Guanajuato. It's from like where my great grandfather came from too. So um, there's some very deep connected roots in that too. This past week, I found some uh, wheat lacoche, or as some people call it, corn smut, I guess. Um, but a delicious mushroom that I cooked and ate a lot of because it's I really love it's 
it's, it's really awesome. Um, and I brought up the Serif project again. So it's there's been a lot of continued conversation, I think, is another outreach component because, I mean, the, the research project ended already, right? Like the it was a year long thing and um, there's still a bunch of connections being made because of that, too. What advice would you give other producers who are interested in this idea of, you know, looking at just diff different um, land race varieties or heirloom varieties, as well as doing like cultural stewardship as part of the project too. I think it's really important for farmers to uh, be able to have the space to do cultural work within within these research projects. Um, it really, as I said, you know, has not only just like produced stories for content, I know that's like the business answer, but like has also just created connections and ways for ways for people to connect uh, genuinely about the work that you're doing too. And so I think it's important and 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 great that it is encouraged to do cultural work within SARE uh, because that adds a component that you can't just like business X, Y, Z yourself into. Uh, I was just want, curious about like what's what's next on the farm? Like you, you talked a little about the three sisters or where where are things taking you? as a result of whether it's this project or what you're drawn to these moments. Yeah, so from this air project, it's going on to continuing the breeding work, um, including that within my framework of my business and, and what I do as a farmer professionally. And so it, it keeps me kind of on my toes with, with what's happening to the plants, the scientific components of that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it has established and kind of directed in a lot of ways as a beginner farmer, if we want to talk on that too, um, that you don't have to just like buy seeds from the seed company and throw them in the ground and stick with those varieties. But if they're, you know, like in my case, are a bunch of ancestrally connected plants that you could steward instead uh, and, and farm and do it to some kind of actual feasible scale to make you be able to sustain being a farmer. Uh, then, uh, you know, you've got a pretty good, pretty good thing going for you. And um, yeah, I hope other farmers have that opportunity as well. The, the corn fact, we need the corn fact is some of this corn that was stewarded in a lot of ways that weren't directly related to how much can this yield smacked up against each other and how much land uh, before it was breeded to that point and where it's been bred now, the plant itself sometimes will grow and, and have this gel on some of its aerial roots. So those are the roots above the soil. Um, that gel creates a symbiotic relationship with an organism that then eats nitrogen from the air and fixes it to the corn, sometimes at the rate of 40 to 70% of the nitrogen that, that corn needs to grow. Well, I look forward to continuing to learn the future story of your work. And thank you for just sharing your heart and farming and things in between.